with the uh, first two. If anyone knows a real cheap place to buy bandages, uh, we may uh, need them in uh, bulk. I just wanted to share a few uh, brief words before uh, the uh, food of the meal. The Vilna Gaon writes that there are lucky mitzvahs and there are unlucky mitzvahs. There are certain mitzvahs that appear to have good fortune because they are widely observed. And there are other mitzvahs that for whatever reason seem to be unlucky because few people fully observe them. What's an example of a lucky mitzvah? The prohibition to eat pig. The Vilna Gaon says is a lucky mitzvah. Because most people, regardless of their background, whether they're very affiliated or unaffiliated, know not to eat pig and tend to abstain from eating pig. What's an example of a unlucky mitzvah, says the Vilna Gon, the prohibition of speaking Lush and Hara, of gossiping. Because even someone who has decades of Jewish education prays three times a day, does all the mitzvahs, and is in general considered to be a highly religious person. For whatever reason, when it comes to abstaining from saying something ill about someone else, uh, they tend to be neglectful in that area. Bris Mila is considered to be a lucky mitzvah, says the Gemara, because it's widely observed, even by people who are not necessarily so observant. And this is a little bit of counterintuitive, because if you were to ask me, I would think that this would be one of the most neglected mitzvahs. You take an eight-year-old baby and lucky eight, 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 eight days. <laughs> That was definitely unlucky. <laughs> you take an eight-day-old baby and you perform voluntary surgery on them. You know, I would think that perhaps parents would be very ambivalent to perform this mitzvah, but the opposite is true. The Gemara says, "Ko mitzvah shekiblu aleim b'simcha, adain osin oso b'simcha." Any mitzvah that was accepted upon themselves, the Jewish people accepted upon themselves originally in a joyous fashion, they, they perform until this day in a very joyous fashion. And bris milah, the Gemara says, when it was given, the Jewish people were joyous about the acceptance of it. So till today, the Jewish people observe this mitzvah with great joy, to the point where the Midrash says that technically you're not required to have a festive meal after the Se'udah, but people go as far as borrowing money they don't have it in order to celebrate the circumcision to the fullest. Why is a bris mila such a tremendous celebration? So Rabbi Ari Tzri Frommer, a Rosh Hashiva of Chachmi Lublin, um, he writes that a person has two births. They have their physical birth, which is their birthday, and they have the day in which their soul is born, in which their neshama is revealed to a greater extent. Their birthday is when you're physically born. When is your soul born? It's born on the day of the bris. So you have a birthday and you have a bris day, is what he says. And one of the interesting facets about a bris is that it seems to have two themes. On one hand, we're offering gratitude to Hashem for the gift of a child. However, there's also a focus on the future an understanding that this, that this is just the beginning. As we say in the bris, Kishem shenichles the bris, kein nekanis the Torah ulechupa umaisim tovim. Just like the child entered the bris, may the child continue to perform mitzvot and in the future and develop themselves. There's an understanding that parents are charged with the task to carefully nurture, guide, and assist the child to develop into an individual who is honorable, virtuous, and loyal to the principles of the Torah. A child is pure potential, and hopefully with the assistance of the parents and the teachers, the child will develop an identity and stand for something noble in this world. And I was thinking this week how there are many similarities between the growth of a child and the development of a community. Just as a child starts off with pure potential, and needs to develop a noble identity with lofty ideals, so too a community is basically potential and needs to develop an identity and a culture. Every community needs to ask themselves who they are and what they represent and to develop their character. The Gemara tells us 
of different communities that develop certain lofty ideals. The Gemara in Sota tells us about a city called Luz. And in this city, people prosper greatly. It's where the tzacheles, the blue dye, was processed. And the inhabitants of the city, says the Gemara, were not exiled, they were not conquered, and they lived a very long life. Why did they, why were they blessed with such good fortune? The Gemara says because the city was founded on principles for care for travelers, care and concern for those who are passing through, and in merit of that identity, the community prospered and had good fortune. The Gemara in Sanhedrin tells us of community that was called Kushta. Kushta means tr truth. In this town, everyone said the truth. No one ever lied. This was their model, this was their MO, this was their trademark. One day, a certain rabbi named Rav Tavos, who was generally an honest man, he married a girl from this town, and he moved in. And one day, someone knocked on the door, asked to, see, to speak to his wife. His wife was bathing, but he didn't want to say that, so he said that she wasn't home. And unfortunately, a misfortune happened in the family. And when the town found out that he said something dishonest, they said, what are you doing? You're, you're, this is not who we are. We have a reputation. We're a community that is honest and you're not following our dictates, they, they chastised him because he, he strayed from the community identity. So just as an individual needs to develop and cultivate a noble character, have a series of ideals that he or she adheres to, so too, in the broader sense, a Tibor, a community, is required to do the same. It's uh, hard to believe, but Lisa and I are concluding our ninth year here at the Fifth Avenue Synagogue. We were married for 10, and nine of them are here at the shul. This is the uh, third bris that we are celebrating with the community. And we express our appreciation to Hashem every day for granting us the blessing of being part of this community for the past nine years. The shul is like a family to us, and we truly feel close to each and every one of you. Our job is to help serve you spiritually and emotionally, and we try our best each and every day. The shul has a storied past, and has brought great honor to Hashem for these past 60 years, and is about to enter a new stage with Hashem's help, with the hopefully the end of corona and the hiatus, a new and beautiful building will about to open up. And just as Hashem has assisted the shul to have a glorious past, um, may we merit to become one of those communities that has a legendary identity, a community that has trademark values, a community that stands for something noble. And please God, may the outward aesthetic beauty of the building serve as a symbolic marker and reminder of the beautiful character of those who come to Davin in this holy Mikdash Ma'at, this miniature sanctuary. Lisa, Lisa and I wanted to thank the entire community, <coughs> the board members, the clergy, and the staff for being so kind-hearted to us uh, all these years. I'd like to thank my parents and Lisa's parents for all their care and support <coughs> that they always offer us, and this occasion is no different. I'd like to thank Moshe and Akiva and they wanted another younger brother, and it's very hard to say no to them. <laughs> so they, they got what they uh, wanted. And of course, I thank you to Lisa. She definitely deserves a, a lot of uh, gratitude uh, to thank her. Uh, she works full time, she hosts often, she tries to assist the shul as much as she can. She's a wonderful wife and a fantastic mother to Moshe and Akiva, and we look forward to a new stage together. In terms of the name, the second name, Aharon, happens to be my grandfather's name and Lisa's grandfather's name. Uh, Aaron, Lisa's grandfather died before she was born, and my grandfather, Aaron, died when I was very, very young. I have very, very few memories of him. I do remember him, uh, two memories. He know. lived in Borough Park. I remember walking down 13th Avenue with all the excitement, holding his hand, and remembering how exciting that was. And he also, I think, taught me chess. <laughs> Those are the uh, two memories I have, and where it's a great honor for us to honor them by uh, naming uh, our son after them. And Dove, 
we hope to call him Dovi. Uh, Dove is, uh, means bear, so I guess Dovi means teddy bear, I don't know. It's the name that we like. And it's a curious thing to name your children after animals. So people do that. People name the child Svi, which means a uh, deer, Arye, which means a lion, Dove, which means a bear. I don't know, if you ask me, I would name my child a duck. The ducks are nice and calm and quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to name the children after animals. But the idea comes from uh, Yaakov. Yaakov named, left his children after animals. And the idea is, is that people should use their strength and their courage to serve Hashem and to do greatness in the world. And that's ultimately what these names represent. That person should direct their energies uh, to, good, to, to purposeful and meaningful activities in this world. I want to thank everybody for joining us. And please partake of the, the student's